Greetings, building science enthusiasts, and welcome back to the Building Science Podcast. This episode is brought to you by Passive House Austin. Passive House Austin is an organization with a vision. Their mission is to advocate for the adoption of Passive House standards of design and construction in the greater Austin, Texas area and beyond through means of education, governmental petition, and targeted industry efforts. For more information and to find out how you can join this group of industry thought leaders, check out PassiveHouseAustin.org. Welcome to this. Okay. Uh, welcome to the Building Science. To the Building Science Podcast. 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 Welcome to the Building Science Podcast. Bringing the human factor to architecture and design. Brought to you by Positive Energy in Austin, Texas. Okay, hello and welcome back, everybody. Welcome back to the Building Science Podcast. This is Christoph Irwin here with my sidekick, as always, Miguel. Hello. <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, today we're going to be talking with my good friend and colleague, John Semelhack with Think Little. Please say hello, John. Hello, John. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, John and Positive Energy, I mean, John's firm, Think Little and Positive Energy, we're both basically engaged in the same activity, which, you know, very simply put, could be that we're both engaged in the skillful application of uh, energy and resources to create high quality indoor environments. Uh, and that's pretty simple. Uh, and in fact, we're going to be talking about three topics today that are both basic in the sense that there's nothing hidden or tricky. Um, we're just going to be applying thoughtful uh, decision making. And they're also advanced in the sense that they're relatively infrequently discussed or known, certainly in a broad format, or at least in my market. Uh, we're going to be talking about specifically hot water delivery systems. That'll be first up. And then we're going to talk about ERVs, HRVs, which are energy or heat recovery ventilators. And then at the end, assuming we get time, we're going to talk a little bit about low static air handlers and distribution systems, why to do it and how to do it. So, um, John, last time we talked, Think Little was engaged in um, some mechanical design, some performance testing, a good bit affiliated with Passive House, doing some single family residential in Charlottesville, Virginia. Anything to update us on? Uh, no, we're still doing the same stuff, just a little bit more of it. Still doing a lot of passive house work uh, and then some other multifamily work, including some multifamily HVAC design and testing airflow balancing work, uh, which is you know, mostly in the, in the Virginia market. Fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's good for both of us that the knowledge and skills that we traffic in are becoming more known and more asked for. <laughs> Just a few years ago, they, it was less so. So hot water delivery. We had originally, you and I discussed talking about actually heat pump water heaters, but now we've decided to go up a level and try to go through in a smooth way talking about the fundamental decision on whether we use gas or electric as the primary energy source for hot water generation. So what do you think about gas versus electric, John? Okay. So uh, for me, it's, it's a pretty easy choice. Uh, I think for our big picture climate change concerns, as well as air pollution concerns, uh, it's basically, or it's well past time, I would say, to stop installing new fossil fuel infrastructure. So yeah, that yeah. doesn't just apply to like coal-fired power plants. That also applies to gas water heaters and homes and gas furnaces and things like that. Mm -hmm. So the uh, that part of the decision tree is uh, made a lot easier if you just cut off that you know that side of the trunk called fossil fuels. Yeah, yeah. We're certainly not um, as a society. We're not setting up a renewable gas delivery grid, and uh, you know. For some reason, the climate change word, right? It's a, it shouldn't be. It absolutely shouldn't be. But it's somehow there's people that go, "Oh no, I, that doesn't involve me." You know, it's sort of like they have the privilege to assume that that doesn't concern them. But I remember when my wife was pregnant, we couldn't eat fish 
she was told not to eat fish, um, local fish caught here in, in the Gulf of Mexico because of mercury, mercury levels. Right. Because of the coal-fired power plants, right? So I just, just use that as a quick metaphor to like, no, no, this stuff, it affects everybody. You know? Right. Yeah. It's not just climate change. There's, uh, you know, there's a bunch of different reasons to stop burning stuff. Yeah. And, you know, one of the highlights, and we've, we've heard it before on this show, but the 3,500 degree or so flame that is natural gas when it's burning, to use that to heat water to 130, let's say, and air to 70, in terms of exergy, it's just a non starter. There's two more issues then, which is uh, price vol. Besides exergy, there's price volatility uh, with natural gas, um, and then right. I mean, yeah, natural gas is a lot. Um, I guess the you know the, the price and distribution is a lot less regulated compared to mm-hmm. electricity. So you definitely do see a lot of volatility. You always see you know the the seasonal volatility where. There's so much more demand for it in the wintertime for uh, gas furnace heating that really drives up the price. Yeah, it's very volatile in the winter. Yeah, and you know the, the other side of it with gas is that it, we're not making any more, <laughs> and there's just no way around it. We are finding new ways to get to it. You know, this horizontal fracture technology uh, is definitely a new way to deliver gas to us. And a lot of the costs associated with it, you know, the, the sky as a sewer metaphor and then the groundwater issues, which are, um, I think, they're becoming less contentious. Most people agreeing that there are associated even seismic activity with fracking. So right. there's just a lot of right. good reasons to, to, when you're thinking about heating water, getting back to that topic, mm-hmm. there's just a lot of good reasons to focus on moving away from gas. Right. And yeah, and switching over to electricity, the, you know, your, your, your gas water heater will never get cleaner from an environmental perspective. That's whereas right. your electric water heater is constantly getting cleaner every month, every month. Mm-hmm. There are new renewables coming onto the grid and fossil fuel plants retiring. Uh, and so your electric water heater uh, actually gets cleaner without you even doing anything about it. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's electric, both just electric resistive and uh, heat pump water heaters. Right, right, and I, you know, I certainly I'm not a big advocate for electric resistance water heating. It has a few applications where it makes sense, but heat pump water heating, I think, is really where um, where it needs to be uh, in you know now and in the future. The unfortunate thing is that we don't have a lot of products available right now and we don't, you know, in the, in some of the products that are available, um, you know, they do have some downsides that have to be acknowledged. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's Let's dig the, into that. So yeah. moving aside from electric resistive and, uh, actually let's, let's stay on electric resistive for just one more minute. When would you put in a resistance water heater? I think if the, if the hot water demand was very low somewhere, then I might put in an electric resistance water heater just because the equipment is inexpensive. Okay. I can tell you one where I've been concerned about it, but maybe you can update me then. And it's when the water heater closet or the mechanical room where the water heater will be is uh, has the unfortunate geographic location of very close to the head of the master bed, you know, the master bedroom very close to the bed. Mm, and I've been concerned about the sound pressure. Right, um, right. So yeah, in new construction, there's you know opportunities to change around the floor plan and design around that. In retrofits, that's harder. Although that's that's relatively rare to have that uh-huh. mechanical room backed up to the head of the bed. Uh-huh. Okay, but let's keep yeah. a, keep an ear out for sound pressure as we go through it. <laughs> sure. So what, with, what's, what's uh, available today? What what are the well, so the, I mean, my the biggest problem with electric water heaters is um, is their efficiency is is quite poor compared to a heat pump water heater. Mm-hmm. Uh, Can you put some numbers to that? So, in terms of the uh, nowadays, we have a new metric called the uniform energy factor, the UEF, right. and the, uh, the the best residential electric water heaters will be a 0.94 or a 0.95 UEF. And the very best heat pump water heaters will be at a 3.6 or 3.7. So 
So close to four times less energy use to do the same job. Now, when you went to the very best heat pump water heaters, those were the very best uh, using R410A as the refrigerant. Is that right? That's uh, no. I think the um, I think yeah. most of them are using 134A. Oh, 134A. Excuse me. Mm-hmm. Yes. In terms of the the kind of the package system, yeah, the where package the, system, not the system. The tank and the, there's a heat exchanger wrapped around the tank. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's there's the big reason right there. If you're using it, once you've just made the rational, forward looking, sane decision to not use gas for heating water, then Really, the next decision is even almost just as easy. Today, 2018, you should be looking at heat pump water heaters. But you commented well, that the offerings on the market, um, I know there's been some volatility. Some initial manufacturers are no longer offering products. Who are you looking at today? And you can name brands on this show. But. Sure. So let's see. In terms of packaged water heaters, uh, packaged heat pump water heaters, um, the big Brand names that are making them right now are Ream slash Rude mm-hmm. and A.O. Smith and Bradford White. Um, Bradford White, they're the ones who took over the GE line, which was the most popular model that was out there. Right. Um, but the, the highest performance equipment that also happens to be the quietest are the newest models from Ream. Um, they have a, a 50, 65, and 80 gallon models that their um, uh, decibel sound pressure ratings from the manufacturer are pretty close to what you would get like from an Energy Star dishwasher. Wow, so that's fantastic. It's the kind of thing where if, if you don't mind the sound from your dishwasher in the kitchen, you probably aren't going to mind the noise from. Uh, a, a high performance heat pump water heater. Are all three of those the, the Ream Rude, the A.O. Smith, and the GeoSpring? No, no, not GeoSpring. It, uh, Bradford White. Mm-hmm. Are all of those ductible? Can you pull? Well, before we talk about that, actually, <laughs> explain mm-hmm. how heat pump water heater works. That might be a good. Let's just review that. So, um, in a in the simplest sense, the heat pump water heater pulls heat from the air in the room that it's in and dumps that heat into the water tank. Uh, right. Use a compressor and a fan to move the air and a pair of heat exchangers. Very good. Yep. Yeah. And the vapor compression cycle. And as you said, using 134A. So the duct kits then, they allow you to source where you're going to get your heated air or your right. so you input can air duct stream. in your um, return air or your inlet air, if you want to call it that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and or you can duct out your cooler discharge air. Yeah. Um, uh, the ream units I really like because it's there's no duct kit. The the product just has a pair of eight inch collars uh, that are integrated into the water heater uh, on the top and on the side of the unit. So mm-hmm. there's no additional duct kit to purchase. So if you want to duct in and or duct out, you just uh, tie in uh, eight inch ductwork to the system. Love it. Does that decrease the sound pressure even more? It certainly could, yeah. And A.O. Smith used to have a duct kit. Do you know if they still do? I think they still do, but it's an add-on product, and that's the same with the Bradford White model. All of those are available in that 50, 65, 80 range. Is that right, or there's some differences? Bradford White is only in the 50 and 80, but I think A.O. Smith has the the midsize as well. Okay. And then when you're doing these multifamily, how are you approaching those? Oh, yeah, that's really interesting to talk about. So um, a lot of it, the decision tree often starts on who is paying the utility bills and whether or not the apartments are individually metered or there's a master meter. So when, if they're individually metered, then that generally is going to mean one water heater per apartment. Um, and so, yeah. are these apartments, do they need a 50-gallon? Are they going smaller? And that pushes them uh, into they, electric resistance? Most of the time, they do not need a 50-gallon. Right. But if you want a heat pump water heater, there's nothing smaller. Right. Than a so right that's now. another market factor pushing uh, electric resistance. Right, exactly. So upfront cost is often a big deal. And, you know, I mean, well, it's a big deal everywhere, but especially in multifamily housing. So, um yeah, the, it's it's tough to to make that sell. Um, but on the projects where we have um, the owner 
paying the bills. So we have a master meter. Mm -hmm. Uh, Two projects I'm working on right now are geared towards seniors. So they're mostly one bedroom and two bedroom apartments. And certainly, you know, not every apartment needs a 50 gallon water heater. And what we're doing is we're sharing water heaters between apartments. Uh, So we have one project is a three floor uh, building where we're putting the water heaters on the middle floor and we're serving three apartments stacked. So the water heater will serve the floor it's on and the apartment above and the apartment below uh, through a manifold hot water distribution system that's in the water heater closet. So you're getting away from the, you know, the centralized water. Um, still you have something like distributed water heating. For station. that project, the water heater equipment cost will be in the same ballpark as gas-fired water heaters, maybe a little bit more expensive for the heat pumps. Mm-hmm. But then we're completely eliminating the piping cost, the pipe insulation cost, and all the labor that's involved in setting up uh, a centralized circulation loop. And then, of course, the pump we're eliminating the pump energy and all of that circulation loop heat loss that happens 24-7 all year long. All right. So the other heat pump water heater topic is, of course, the split system heat pump water heaters. Yeah. So those are really exciting. I know you have a nice podcast um, um, maybe a month or so back with yeah. uh, from Sandend. Yeah, um, that's a really uh, exciting technology to look at and product. I know they're, um, you know, I'd like to see a lot of competition among the manu- manufacturers. Here, here. Uh, up the ante to deliver better performance, better quality, and so on. So I certainly wish the best for Sandin, but I also hope that other manufacturers come into that game. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know that in other countries, there are other manufacturers, Mitsubishi being one that I know of, that has Mm -hmm. those systems. Um, A little update, I actually recently installed a Sandin at my house and was really pleased by how, uh, quote unquote, easy it was. I mean, getting my old water heater out and all <laughs> that was not all that simple because um, for various reasons, it ended up upstairs in my house, which is the worst place to put a water heater. But, um, you know, essentially did all the plumbing per the, the uh, installation manual, powered it up, you know, kind of like, really, is it that easy? Yep. Came, came right. on hot water. Because it makes very hot water, up, up to around 150, 160 degrees, I have a mixing valve, which is slightly different configuration than I used to have. My, my cold kind of goes in a loop and then mixes with the hot out of the water heater to serve the hot water mm-hmm. line going back to the house. Yep. But um, I'm a little embarrassed to say I have yet to put a current clamp on that thing. I cannot wait. What I actually plan to do is uh, um, turn it off for like overnight, let the water kind of get quote unquote cold, even though my summertime supply water temperature here in Austin is around 70 and then turn it on and see what kind of current it draws when it's trying to fill a cold tank. And then of course I'm going to be monitoring that over time. Right. Yeah. I think the, um, the data that I've seen from the real world applications of those units, especially when they're used just for water heating, which is mostly what they're really Mm -hmm. designed for is, you know, fantastic. Um, and you would do, you have with those, with this, with the sand and split system, you definitely have faster recovery times. Uh, you have with a large tank, you have, uh, 80 some gallons of, yeah. uh, of actual storage. Whereas the, uh, every, the American manufacturers, um, 80 gallons really means 72. Mm-hmm. If you knew that, <laughs> I did not know that. How come? Why they're is allowed, that? They're allowed uh, to be ten percent under on their actual storage. Oh, fascinating! To what they say it is typical Americans. <laughs> it's, a D, it's a DOE rule, so they let them do it, so they do it. Um, but that's not the case with the, the sand and tank. You know, it's I believe its rated volume is the is actually what it is. 
Yeah, and um, the first hour rating is is like a hundred gallons, something like that. Right. I mean, you you affect. I, mean, I won't say universally, you have endless hot water, but for most families, you effectively have endless hot water. So, which is kind of you know that's always one of the selling points of the tankless gas water heaters is you know never running, you know never having to worry about running out. But yeah. if you have you know eighty five gallons of uh, one hundred and forty or fifty degree water. Uh, at the ready, um, it's really unlikely you're going to run out in most situations. That's right. And, and you're also mixing it down. Like, you know, so right. when I right. run my hot water to take a shower, I'm not pull, like, let's say I have, you know, whatever, um, 1.5 gallons per minute or something at my shower. I'm not getting, I'm not using that much hot water coming out. Yeah. I think the, one of the, for me, one of the big, I know the, the ream units are, uh, the package systems are a lot quieter than previous models have been. But if you want something that makes no noise inside, the split systems are are what you want to go for. Yeah. And if I had to replace my heat pump water heater, uh, heat pump water heater at home tomorrow, and uh, and have the money for it, I would. Put yeah, there it you go. That second part. I'm really grateful to stand in for helping me out with mine. You know, the the sound pressure on that outdoor unit is it's astounding. It's like 30 i don't remember exactly 30 some dba phenomenally quiet like to the point and i it ended up located next to my uh i guess circa 1998 outdoor unit for my air conditioner so i can never mm-hmm. tell if my <laughs> water heater is on except for when i stand next to it i get this right. nice cold breeze cold and there's a often a puddle on the little slab that i poured and mounted it on because uh, it's also you know of course it's drying some of that air so one, one thing that I did want to talk about was, um, uh, I guess, like, uh, why why heat pump water heaters are not popular. Yeah, why are uh, they not popular? Really you know, their annual sales are something less than 100,000 units per year at this point, I think, uh, in that ballpark anyway. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, the number of hot water sold nationwide is like 10 million. So they're, you know, they're at under... Uh, you know, 1% market share. Um, and I think one of the, in my mind, the, the, you know, the, the big market is of course in the replacement water heater market, you know, it's existing homes. Mm-hmm. Existing and the, the sales cycle is not conducive to heat pump water heaters because when do, when do people, you know, replace their water heaters? Right. When they have to, when their old one, when their old one breaks and they're in a hurry or when it starts leaking on their floor. Yeah. And when that happens, you know, they call up the plumber and ask, you know, what does your distributor have in stock and what can you install tomorrow? And what's not going to, you know, break my wallet. Yeah. And the heat pump water heater is none of those things. Yeah. Or it's, you know, it's, it's more expensive up front and then saves significantly uh, right away. Um, but the distributor might not have it in stock. The plumber might not have experience with it. Certainly the plumber isn't pushing for it. Um, and if you want something installed the next day, that's going to be the kind of bottom of the barrel equipment. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one thing that I've been kind of thinking about, um, you know, in the frame of mind of um, uh, business model innovation, uh, like Jigger Shaw and the Energy Gang, mm-hmm. uh, trying to think of ways in the residential world to change how water heaters get sold. Yeah. Uh, and I haven't come up with anything solid yet, but it's, uh, I have things percolating. Yeah, that's that's really fascinating. I mean, I love that idea of trying to how do we get these to be ecosystem friendly? You know, how do they get to be part of that? Because one of the side benefits that I didn't realize I was going to get was that I we have hard water down here in Austin, a lot of limestone and calcium carbonate in my water lines and apparently in my water heater pickup, because when I uh, replaced it, man, all my showers are much more uh, robust. And so oh, I'm wondering if you could like somehow measure the decrease in flow, but you know, you'd have to put something in line to do that. I've seen, I've heard of, and I, I have, I wonder if you have experience with this It's a little bit of it off to the side about someone talking about a clamp on GPM meter that you can just clamp around a water line. There are, 
there are some ultrasonic um, clamp water flow meters or fluid flow meters. Uh, I don't think they're cheap. No. Uh, there is a brand new product out on the market that their the company is. Yeah, I just saw it a while ago. Marketing it more for kind of leak detection and uh, kind of building safety and things like that. Um, but you, but I'm thinking of getting one uh, just for my hot water for my cold water inlet to my tank, mm-hmm. so I can measure how much uh, hot water I use and when I'm using it and geek out on it. All right, next topic. Next topic here is ERVs and HRVs. So these are energy or enthalpy recovery ventilators and heat recovery ventilators. Um, you and I both, John, we work in areas where there's some humidity around. So we are using ERVs more than HRVs. Right. How about we start with a, a general um, definition of what an ERV is? Right. So yeah, <laughs> ERVs are balanced ventilation systems first. So uh, you are bringing outside air into the house, uh, filtering that and supplying it uh, to different parts of the house. And at the same time, you're in, you are exhausting an equal amount of air, typically from uh, bathrooms to the outside. So it's balanced in relation to the uh, the building enclosure so you're not having any influence on building pressure with respect to outside uh, as long as it's uh, you know set up and balanced properly mm-hmm. uh, some ERVs or a couple of residential ERVs are self-balancing but the vast majority of them need conditioning so that's, yeah. a, that's a big deal that's really really often overlooked yeah. on the HVAC installer front um, so that's balanced ventilation. And then ERVs and HRVs add uh, heat exchange uh, via a heat or enthalpy exchange core of various types uh, in the middle of the box. So uh, you're, transfer, you're transferring heat energy for the, from the warmer side to the cooler side in terms of the air streams without transferring air molecules. That's and right. in the ERVs, you're also transferring moisture from the uh, higher moisture side to the lower moisture side. Uh, not in terms of relative humidity, but in terms of dew point or grains mm-hmm. per pound or however you want to look at it from an um, actual moisture content perspective. Yeah. All right, so before we get into the numbers and how that works, I'm going to go down a level from that definition. So these are boxes, and in, in a residential context, they're typically about the size of your microwave oven, maybe slightly squished a little thinner. Yeah. yeah. Um, but they have typically four ducts on them, and again, in residential, they're usually four six-inch ducts, um, one coming in from outside, uh, one going out to the outside, and then one coming into the inside of the house, which is distributed and one pulling from a distributed distribution system back into the ERV. And just to, just so we can all have like a, a good gut level understanding of the business end of an ERV, um, the business end of the ERV is heat and moisture exchange. And if you imagine a sheet of Tyvek, I like to think about it this way, is a sheet of Tyvek is obviously a very poor thermal ex- insulator. So if you had hot Let's say uh, in Charlottesville, you have hot summer air on one side of the sheet of Tyvek uh, moving into the building and cool, you know, air conditioned air that you've paid to have cool on the inside of the building leaving. When those two air masses on the opposite side of that sheet of Tyvek, obviously there's no uh, good insulation there and the heat will move to the cold. So the heat sheds its heat to the cold on the way out. And in the exactly analogous way, Tyvek is very vapor open, so the moisture will move from the, in this case, and if it's summer in Charlottesville, it'll move from the high moisture content side, which is probably measured in grains or dew point, to the low moisture content side that you've you've paid to have. So it's really pretty simple, right? It's just this, this uh, separator that lets heat and moisture go through, but the key is that the mass of air itself didn't mix. 
Right. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's, um, well, the ones that I work with usually have, um, uh, cross flow cores and it's basically really fancy corrugated cardboard that <laughs> at 90 degree angles in layers in a whole bunch of layers, like 60 layers of corrugations and the corrugations are there to maximize the surface area contact between those membranes mm-hmm. the More surface area. They have the, the more heat exchange and moisture exchange to look at. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so now you can, it's kind of mad. So maybe we should say this too. The overall goal of an ERV or HRV is to reduce the energy impact, the negative energy impact of ventilating a space. If it's super right. cold. So, uh, so it's, it's a ventilation system first. So yeah. it, has to, it has to perform that function well and reliably. And then mm-hmm. second, while you're doing it, let's, let's retain some of the energy or... Mm-hmm. In the summertime, let's keep some of the heat and moisture out of the building. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then an important side impact can be that you have the ability to control pressurization in your building, which could be a very big you deal. Can, yeah, so you can commission them to be slightly positive or slightly negative or perfectly balanced. Uh huh. Could you imagine in that slightly positive and negative? Let's just assume our listeners can understand when that would be useful because that that would take a little long to go through. But could could you imagine a scenario where you would switch that seasonally? Summer, you would want it to be positive. Winter, you want it to be negative, and you go up to the ERV so, and make an adjustment. I, I guess I can imagine some scenarios, but I think <laughs> real world application, uh, for the most part, I like to keep it simple and go with uh, a balanced scenario mm-hmm. and just keep the enclosure as absolutely tight as possible. Then uh, you have okay. mm-hmm. near zero air leakage through the enclosure and a balanced system. Uh, with your ERV. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's interesting. I hear at our headquarter, positive energy headquarters, our enclosure is just a suggestion. As you know, you've been here very <laughs> leaky, uh, ACH 50 of 14. Mm-hmm. Um, and we recently got one of the uh, Panasonic EV tens. And mm-hmm. so that has the ability to, I can let, so for instance, what we're doing is we have the, incoming CFM set as high as it would go, which is a hundred CFM and the outgoing, I think it's around 50 now, maybe a little bit higher, but that even on this enclosure, that gives us a fairly consistent, uh, one and a half to three and a half Pascal pressurization. And the range I think is from when it's windy out or not windy out. I've been really pleased with that, that it could handle this enclosure. And, and right. So, in, so then in your scenario, you're ensuring that you're, getting near zero um, infiltration from the outside. So all of your outside air is coming through the ERV. So it's coming through the really nice filter that those ERVs have. That's right. Pushing air out through through the leaks in the building. Yeah, that's right. And then we've noticed it. We as uh, people that work here every day, the air quality is definitely better. Um, Mm -hmm. And the CO2 can be an issue. Um, Interestingly, we have... Like we're in our conference room right now. The door is shut, and because of s- some noise issues with our ducts, we have actually the ducts are in the room with us, and so is the ERV. We have it off, and right now my CO2 is at like 1300. But we turn that <laughs> ERV back on, it'll go back down five, six hundred. It doesn't get all the way down to 400, which is where it is in the morning, so right? That's like outside air. We need a lot of air changes mechanically to keep it at 400. That's yeah, mm-hmm. there's a well, usually we'll see what the well, maybe what the ongoing research says about it. But um, yeah, where are your buildings yeah. staying? Do you are you monitoring CO two and watching that? I'm monitor- monitoring my office right now, and we have not installed our ERV yet. Mm-hmm. So we um, uh, and we I'm embarrassed to say that we've been in here since February, and we haven't tested our office for air <laughs> leaking yet. That's okay. Um, <laughs> we're too busy testing everybody else's stuff. Uh, but uh, I am monitoring CO2, and um, we must not be very leaky here because even uh, I'm solo in the office right now, and I'm, uh, I had the door open earlier and the window open earlier, and I was down under 600 parts per million, and now I'm closing in on 800. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when we put my two employees and myself in here, 
if we don't have things opened up, we'll run, you know, over 1500. Yeah. Uh, so mm, that's a fascinating. Yeah, we've, just been, we've just been a little lazy setting up the ERV. Uh, I think once it actually gets really hot and humid out here and we really just can't keep the windows open, um, we'll, uh, We'll definitely get on that. Yeah, yeah, we have the same thing here. So, I, just to go expanding that a tiny bit, I was just at the AIA uh, for a, the local AIA offices for a seminar, and pretty crowded room, pretty small. The CO two was around. Wait, 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 let me guess. Let me guess. Oh yeah, so about thirty people in about a oh I don't know, let's say thirty by thirty space. So we're just gonna have a lot of thirties there. Okay, I'm going to guess it was uh, eighteen hundred. <laughs> it was uh 1970 so you were very close okay. yeah that's, have you ever been a, in your car i saw your i saw your instagram post earlier today ah. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever so i did it in my car i don't think i posted that but i have my uh daughter and two of her friends in the back seat my wife in the front seat and i thought oh i wonder what co2 is you know didn't notice anything i didn't notice stuffiness or anything like that it was 4200 <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's really high. And as you say, the thresholds are, are still, you know, based on emerging research, but Delos, you know, the well standard there, they're at 800. Mm-hmm. Uh, most people you know, are somewhere in the 800 to a thousand range saying higher than that. Right. Is definitely- yeah, I, you know, I'm, you know, at, um, at home when I was monitoring and here in the office, we're trying to keep it under 800. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think that's a fantastic target. Yeah. And that is, you know, it's a good way to think about the, what the ERV is doing is it's the lungs of the building. I mean, it's the, in the sense that what do your lungs do? They take in outside air and they deliver it somewhere for that some use. So an ERV is taking outside air and it's optimizing the, you know, the ventilation function, which is absolutely about keeping CO2 low. But I want to get back to, you're talking about the corrugations and that's a good way to think about these little passages where the incoming airstream is flowing adjacent to the outflowing airstream. There's two things about that. There's counterflow and crossflow. Mm-hmm. Um, are they both on the market or is one yes. eclipsing the other? Tell me about that. So in North America, I think most of the ERVs and HRVs are um, crossflow. Mm-hmm. So the airflows are at 90, you know, they are 90 degrees to one another. Mm-hmm. Uh, and my understanding is that in a, it's kind of the cross flow. Um, you can get, you know, great performance from cross flow. Um, but I think cross flow, you get the, maybe the highest amount of, um, surface area contact in the smallest possible package. Mm-hmm. So it's a combination of the performance engineering as well as the manufacturing cost engineering. Mm-hmm. Uh, Counter flow, you have so with the cross flow, you have um, sh- the individual sheets of corrugation are in contact with one another with kind of all the little tubes within one sheet all flowing in the same direction. With counterflow, all of the little tubes are effectively interwoven. Yeah. You have uh, even more contact, but it's a lot more complicated to, uh, I think, manufacture uh, counterflow heat exchangers. And so we see some, some units, uh, especially the, uh, the Zender units are, they're actually a combination. They are a cross and counterflow. Mm-hmm. The your Panasonic unit at your office is a cross and, and counter. Yeah, the IntelliBalance. Uh-huh. But most of the most of the North American manufacturers are just using uh, counterflow. Big picture, all you need to do is look at the performance specs because the performance specs tell you how the system is really working. Mm-hmm. So you don't need to you know, argue over beers about whether it should be counter or That's right. Or cross. Yeah. Ultimately it's, it's what kind of exchange are you getting? So let's talk about those performance specs. Um, how would, would somebody evaluate you know, quantitatively the performance of an ERV? So there's, uh, in, in terms of ERVs, there's uh, three key performance metrics. There's the sensible recovery efficiency. Mm-hmm. So this is the amount of, or the percentage of uh, sensible heat transfer 
at standardized conditions. There's a rating for that in a winter condition and a different rating for that in a summer condition. Right. So that's your that's your heat transfer. And then you have moisture transfer or a latent transfer mm-hmm. percentage. Uh, and then you have uh, fan efficacy or power input to the system. And so what you want is the highest possible heat transfer, the lowest possible power input, and just the right amount of moisture transfer. <laughs> yeah, but they don't <laughs> actually spec the uh, – if you go to look up online, you know, like HVI is where these things are, hvi.org. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in if it were commercial, then you could go to AHRI. They have some specs on that. You usually see the total recovery efficiency or even the adjusted total of recovery efficiency. Right. And so you have so to back out. The adjusted, total, adjusted total re- in the HVI listings, the new, uh, uh, the adjusted sensible recovery efficiency, that is the heat transfer of the core uh, derated for any cross leakage uh, across the core or any air leakage of the case mm-hmm. and any heat transfer of the case itself. Heat transfer of the case so, itself. But it, you've adjusted out the fan energy that might be communicated to the airstream. Um, cr- no. Is so the, the adjusted actually does include any benefit or, or negative okay. impact of the fan energy. Good. And so they they have the adjusted SRE and then the adjusted TRE, the total recovery efficiency, right? Right. So, the, yeah, the total, unfortunately, the total it's combined, the, it's the enthalpy uh-huh. efficiency. So it's the combination of uh, moisture transfer and sensible heat transfer. Some of the manufacturers do publish their moisture transfer in the winter condition, and then a couple publish it. For both the winter condition and the summer condition. Yeah, not enough. I mean, it's it's hard to find these things. It's hard to find those. Specs. Right. But if you can, you can if they do publish it for the summer condition. So if you know the summer moisture transfer and you know the total enthalpy transfer, you can do the calculations on the back end to calculate what the sensible heat transfer has to be to arrive at that uh, total enthalpy percentage. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a bit of a pain, and it would be nice if they just published yeah, it. Yeah, and I wonder why they don't. I mean, I guess maybe trade secrets are hidden in there somehow. Um, yeah, so the, who are you using? What, what, what manufacturers are you working with? Let's just go. Um, we're using mostly Renew Air right now. Okay. Um, we really like the EV90, EV90P, MTR90, mm-hmm. kind of as a the, the best combination of – Simple design, good performance, and really reasonable price. Mm-hmm. Uh, the um, the Panasonic, we're definitely looking at that yes. one. And um, Renew Air, they have a new model coming out that's more geared towards multifamily that I'm really excited about. And then every now and then we do have a project that has the budget for a Zender unit or uh, a really high-end Brown unit, Brown and Benmar. Mm-hmm. Um, those, are, those are great systems. Yeah, so there you go. You covered all the brands I was hoping you would touch on. <laughs> and who yeah. has the highest recovery efficiencies at the moment? In ERVs? In ERVs, yeah. At what flow? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, let's, let's say the flow is like um, 100 CFM or less. 100 CFM or less. So highest heat transfer is going to be uh, like the Renew Air EV90P and I think the Zender 350 ERV are pretty close. The Renew Air, I think, might have slightly better uh, heat transfer efficiency at that flow. Fascinating. And what would be that SRE, the sensible recovery efficiency? I think the adjusted is 84. Wow. So it's pretty good. Yeah. So that's pretty amazing. I mean, that's you know, eighty-four percent of the heat that you would be bringing in, you don't. Right. Yeah. At uh, you know when it's seventy degrees inside and, and thirty-two degrees outside. Mm-hmm. So what about yeah. fan efficacy? What kind of energy? I mean, I can tell you here from our office. I did do the current clamp on that one. 
it's just under 0.4 amps, you know, right around 43 watts, something like that, which is mm-hmm. pretty bomber. Yeah, so we like to, <laughs> the metric that we like to look at is watts per CFM or CFM per watt, um, depending on how you like to look at it. Um, but we're, you know, we want to see systems that are um, two CFM per watt or greater, or you know, putting, you know, flipping that, taking the inverse 0.5 watts per or CFM less. or less. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so the like the Renew Air units that we use are right around 0.5 when we're using them at their kind of full rated flow. Um, those machines, unfortunately, are just single speed. So if we have a smaller house that only needs 50 or 60 CFM, we have to use a damper to reduce the flow. Yeah. Um, so the power input stays the same. But you don't. Uh, whereas uh, fancy machines have variable speed motors, and you can actually get, um, you know, you can have a, there's some, you know, the Zender units, you can deliver that, you can deliver that 60 CFM at, you know, 30 watts or 25 watts. And I think, you know, the Panasonic is the same way. You can ramp that down to 50 CFM. And if you have really good duct design, you can be under 20 watts. Yeah, it's amazing. And just the efficiency of that. We should make sure we point out that the, because we've had some trouble here in our market with people installing only an ERV in a very low load building and having some trouble in the shoulder seasons, April and October, where you don't necessarily have the dedicated drying inside, right? Where you don't have a dehumidifier. Right. And, yeah. So no yeah, magic GRV drying is not, machines. <laughs> no, right. It's a ventilation machine that uh, brings in less moisture than you would bring in if it was just a uh, straight supply ventilation. Right, right. And if, but if you have nothing drying the air in the home, there's the air conditioner's not on at that time, it's, the ERV is, in fact, increasing the humidity of the home less than it would be right. for the same ventilation. Right. And so, you know, there's a certain camp of people who say, oh, so in those, you know, seasons you should reduce your ventilation rate. Um, and, you know, I think we need the ventilation and we need the moisture mm-hmm. control. I do too. So if we... You know, if the solution is two different pieces, you know, two separate pieces of equipment, one to do the ventilation and one to do the moisture control, then, you know, that's the way it is. Yeah, I agree. And that, that's where we are. Right? We, we're, we're fairly consistent with recommending dehumidification first, ventilating dehumidifiers, I should say, and then ERVs on top of them. You know, you could also argue, depending on the climate and, and the building, that it would dry out later in the year. You know, it's, you could have some limited moisture accumulation for a while, and, or later in the diurnal cycle, it would dry out that day, something like that. Yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of the way I do it at my house. We have, you know, this time of year, our, you know, in June, in, or let's say in July, August, our relative humidity stays at pretty close to 50%, like low 50s, you know, at temperatures around, you know, 74, 75 mm-hmm. degrees, just through our heat pump system running in cooling right. mode. And but this time of year, you know, I run my heat pump system in dry mode, and it manages most of the moisture, but not as well as it does in July. And so, you know, we have... You know, a few weeks at the tail end of spring and a few weeks at the beginning of the fall where our humidity levels are a little bit higher than we'd like them Mm -hmm. to be. And, you know, in a perfect world, I would, you know, I'd probably put in a a dehumidifier. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in your climate, you have a much longer and, you know, more severe humid season. Yeah, we, we call do. it the nine-month March to Hades. <laughs> we do, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've measured right out on our uh, back porch upstairs here, 80-degree uh, dew points. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Uh, upper 70s is, is not that unusual. But um, so ERVs are absolutely necessary for ventilating in humid climates. Talk briefly about HRVs, and then we'll move on to our last topic. We're getting close to end here. Yeah, so yeah, HRVs are, you know, it's the same kind of machine, same kind of fans, uh, very similar heat exchange core. The, the main difference is that the membrane of the core is not vapor permeable. So it's either made of metal or it's made of a impermeable plastic. 
like a high conductivity impermeable plastic. So you get the heat transfer between the airflows without any moisture mm-hmm. transfer. Beautiful. Well said. And there are, we should, we should say that there are uh, enthalpy wheels, there are desiccant dehumidifiers, there's other technologies that are available. John and I are biasing toward, uh, you know, what's available on the market for, vent- for residents. Yeah, in the, residential, in the residential world, there's two or three enthalpy wheels that are out there. Um, most of the equipment is... Uh, cross flow or counter flow mm-hmm. exchange course. Yeah, and it's it's interesting. As far as I know, in the commercial, larger commercial world, it's the opposite. It's, it's mainly enthalpy wheels. Yeah, I think that as you get into higher and higher air flows, um, in order to get the heat and moisture exchange that you want, you need a larger and larger surface amount area. of surface yeah. area. And the enthalpy wheels can pack uh, more surface area per volume of kind of equipment box than uh, than the cross or counter flow cores. When you get into really big airflows, like 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 yeah. CFM. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So to, to wrap up ERVs before we move on to the next topic, I just want to make sure everybody you know understands that there's this implicit now is the time, right? So if you are part of a project team or an owner looking at a new construction, and you heard John and I saying, Gosh, we really like to have earlier, you know, a sand and split system heat pump water heater. Just now we said, oh, absolutely, we're going to have an ERV and we might need a dedicated dehumidifier. Man, if you're making that choice and now's the time, those costs amortized over a long mortgage, they're nothing. You know, I I certainly feel like I would, uh, if I did my house over again, I would be having these systems as non-negotiable you know the the other thing to remember is that most of the time you know the the erv systems you are exhausting from the Mm -hmm. bathrooms on a 24 7 basis and you can uh, in many situations you can eliminate the bathroom exhaust pans so you're you know you're trading some ducting but you're taking out a piece of equipment so it's not the erv is not just adding Mm -hmm. cost to the project you're, you know, you're, you're, you know, getting rid of some other yeah. equipment. Yeah, you know, it's kind of the elephant in the room is this almost intangible, currently un, um, unvalued or undervalued uh, indoor air quality benefit, the health benefit, right? You know, like what's the ROI on, on an ERV or an HRV? It's, um, you know, it's kind of <laughs> like saying what's the ROI on your pillow or your couch, right? It's like just something that you have because you recognize the value. Your healthy meal. Yeah, or what's the ROI of eating a healthy lunch? All right, so bottom line, lungs of the building, they're all about human health. (laughs) You should really be thinking about ERVs and HRVs in your next projects. There's lots of resources online. There's a lot of people probably in your market that you can talk to. You can certainly call John, call us if you have need for consulting on that. Last topic, and let's make it brief. We're actually right at the end here, John. We wanted to talk about low static VRF air handlers and low static distribution systems. And first, let's talk about why. Why are you interested? Why am I interested in low static? Actually, maybe you should start with what is low static and then why are we interested in it? Yeah, let's go. Let's go up a level. Not, you know, we don't have to just talk oh, that's about right. yeah, low VRF, static air handlers generally. Low static air handlers. Why would why would you want a low static air handler on a low static duct system on with any air handler? Um, so, I mean, one is they're quieter, and two is uh, you're using less energy of the air around, and three is because it's it's actually pretty simple to do. All right, very well said. So, quieter uses less energy. Uh, what, what are the limitations? I mean, you, you can't just do low static distribution system anywhere. Uh, I'm sorry. You can't always achieve a static pressure low enough to meet your air handlers. Well, no, you, you can. I mean, uh, uh, it depends on what your restrictions are. So, you know, if you had um, no structural restrictions or aesthetic restrictions, you could design a duct system from scratch that had 
big enough ducts and smooth enough terms. Like, so you can do a whole house on a, a point two inch of water column limitation. You're right. If if the ducts were there first, or if the duct requirements were you know prime right right i mean but you you might not want to do that for various zoning reasons and temperature Mm -hmm. stratification reasons and things like that so you know we're normally looking at you know we're trying to carve up houses into multiple you know they're often relatively large zones but where they have we're going to be able to achieve even temperatures and then we're looking at you know how can we design, um, you know, a compact duct system to, you know, to get the air where it needs to go to provide extremely good filtration on that return air. So we're delivering Mm -hmm. nearly perfectly clean air downstream uh, and to do that quietly and and energy efficient. So what's your, don't tell us your trade secret, John, but there's three three big moves. Now there's the small errors, but the three big moves are Slow the air down by using Mm -hmm. a little bit bigger ducts than our typical practice. Bigger ducts, your air is moving more slowly. You have less turbulence going around the fittings. Two is don't use flex duct (laughs) for making turns. Use smooth sheet metal. Uh, So sheet metal elbows, smooth inside corners on any rectangular elbows and things like that. So both of those, that's really easy. Like going from a six inch duct to a seven or an eight, that takes no change in labor cost and has a very small increase in uh, material cost. Using the, you know, using sheet metal for turning, yes, you know, flex duct is really fast and cheap. So you're adding a little bit of cost there, but you're doing it better. Okay. So then the third big move is your filter. So you're using a, um, much or a significantly larger uh, filter surface area than you would normally see in a, in a typical application, which allows us to keep the pressure drop from the filter to almost nothing while at the same time increasing the uh, particulate mm-hmm. filtration rating uh, considerably. So we can, we're in our systems, we're normally doing MERV 13 filters for the same pressure drop <laughs> as you would see with a Whoa. MERV 2 so, filter. Uh, but you're putting larger cross-section then on that filter, much larger. It's actually, it's not even that. I mean, I was just on a job recently where the installer, um, they put in a MERV 2 filter uh, against what our specs called for, and I looked at the rating, and the pressure drop rating at our design airflow was the same at the same uh, filter size, 20 by 20, as our MERV 13 filter. The difference is that our MERV 13 filter filter is pleated mm-hmm. and is two inches deep. So within that 20 by 20 frame, we're packing in more than twice the surface area. That is awesome. I mean, that, that's really astounding. And it, but it also speaks to me to the, the velocity, the feet per minute. Do you know your feet per minute you're having across that filter or roughly? I think that's probably in the mm-hmm. 150 to 200 feet per minute ballpark. And so the pressure drop across that filter is around 0.04 inches of water. Yeah. And that's fascinating to hear that it's around 0.04, whether it's a MERV 2 or a MERV 13. And then so in your big move there, number one, slow it down. Supply ducts, you're not moving your supply air at 200 feet per minute, but you're slower. I mean, you're probably more like, I'm going to guess 600 feet per minute, something like that, maybe. 450 is our target. 450, so even slower, yeah. So we're, well, I was actually thinking the the trunk line, where, you know, if you have that reducing trunks, or what are you doing? Are you doing radial with like one big box plenum and then runouts from it? It depends on the layout of the house. Um, if it's if it's a if it's a pretty compact layout, yeah, we just have a yeah. simple supply plenum and then branches coming off of that. Other houses, we just we need to extend the trunk. So you know, we'll extend the trunk, reduce the trunk size to keep the velocity pretty consistent and the static pressure in the trunk consistent, and have a you know more traditional looking trunk and branch system. But we keep the we keep the velocity in the trunk at 450 as well. Interesting. So, yeah, so we go a little bit higher. We're, we're up in the 500 600 feet per minute range, but a lot of times we have large areas and long distances to go. Um, so right off of the unit, but you're right. keeping it slow right off of the unit. How how many square feet do you think a zone would be? 
Oh, uh, up mm-hmm. to about 1,500 square feet. It really, you know, we, we look at the layout, we look at the loads, and then, and then the equipment. Um, and we're normally using the Fujitsu single split uh, slim duct systems. Um, and uh, so, we're, you know, we have uh, pretty much we have a, a one ton option and a ton and a half option. And we, you know, yeah. we really like the way that works for us. Uh, we don't often have the need for, mm-hmm. um, you know, for, for two tons. So those are single, those dedicated indoor, dedicated outdoor. Yeah. I like the, mm-hmm. the I don't, several aspects of that. Um, we get better efficiency. We've got some redundancy yeah. as far as the equipment goes. If there's any equipment problems, um, there's a really, really minor cost difference between multi-split systems and single splits. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. It's uh, here at the office we have a uh, you know split system one to one VRF, and it's just been so bomber reliable, so comfortable, and mm-hmm. really just sips the energy. You know, four to five amps at peak load, and it's a three ton system. What are you getting on your one and a half ton split systems? How many amps is this drawing? Do you know? Oh, amps. We're mostly we're um, using the one ton systems more often. Um, we look at watts more often. Okay. Uh, my system at home in the winter time will peak out at around twelve hundred watts. In the summertime, at five or six hundred watts. Yeah, mm-hmm. and that, that's consistent. Ours is slightly lower than that. That, that, when I say four amps at 220 volts, that's like 800 watts. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it, it's phenomenal. And compare that to a, you know, standard unitary, you know, the conventional equipment that's out there. Those numbers are all very low. Oh, one of the, going back to the filters really quick. Uh-huh. Um, one of the interesting things that we've researched a little bit, or actually we talked with indoor air quality researchers is, um, Generally, when you slow the air down uh, going through the filter, the filter performance improves. Yeah. So those MERV ratings are done at like 300 feet per minute, I think. Mm-hmm. I thought it was 400. Um, but... I have to go look at the ASHRAE standard. Um, but there is a particular velocity. So when you slow the air down, you actually start to catch more stuff. Uh, so we think our MERV 13 filters are actually real life performing maybe more like 14 or 15 off the bat. Mm-hmm. Well said, man. F- fascinating. So good thermal performance, good filtration performance, and good energy performance. So those are the reasons to pay attention to distribution systems. I think they're the unsung heroes. You know, we <laughs> we call them the where the rubber meets the road in some sense, right? Because um, if you bought a nice new car and you never inflated the tires properly, that's where the rubber meets the road. You'd always have increased rolling resistance. And if you buy a nice new house and you never pay attention to the duct, you're always going to have increased, you know, airflow resistance for that duct system. So it's something that another one of those do it right the first time. Yeah. And the, you know, the low, you know, low static pressure systems are not exclusive to these, you know, slim duct systems where you kind of have to do it in order to actually move the right amount of airflow. Um, anyone can do a low static pressure system on standard air handlers. So there's, uh, you know, people that I know who have an air handler that can deliver the airflow at 0.6 inches of water column, but they are designing and installing them at 0.2 or 0.3 yeah. and what's the energy uh, because they know how to do it. Do you have an idea what yeah. the energy reduction would be from that? I don't know off the top of my head because I don't normally deal with those kinds of air yeah. handlers. Uh, but, you know, when they're running at full speed, it's, you know, it might on a, maybe a two ton system. It might be in the ballpark of 50 or a hundred Watts on the, in terms of the, uh, the fan power. Yeah. Yeah, it's incredible. So any final comments? No, I think we, we covered a lot of ground, Christoph. It's been a lot of yeah. fun. I really appreciate your time today, John. And thank you all for listening. And we'll be back next time with more.